Welcome to Aussie Wristwatch. If you haven't already, please go and watch the video where I talk about where I won this watch, the Rolex Submariner, also wrist check today. Uh, and in that video, I, I talk about how I came about getting this watch, but I don't actually talk in great detail about the watch. So I thought I'd do that today. Now, I am not going to be the one that's going to school everyone or even probably educate you that much on a Rolex Submariner because let's face it, it is one of the most iconic watches ever. And greater people with far greater horology minds have talked about this watch at great length. But in the spirit of my channel, which is about me learning about watches because notwithstanding I have a YouTube channel, I don't know that much about them. I wanted to do a little, just a little touch lightly on this watch and a little bit of the history of it. So let's get into it, shall we? The famous Rolex Submariner. Now, technically I have a Rolex Submariner date. I think the correct terminology is a Rolex Submariner is a no date which uh, incidentally is the watch that I have been on a list for for well over 12 months with <laughs> no realistic uh, view to getting that watch ever. But I now have the Rolex Samarina date. And as I said in my initial video with this, I always found the Cyclops on a Rolex to be quite ugly. I think is the, is the nicest way I can put it. And you know, just aesthetically, speaking do you know what i mean but now that i've lived with this watch uh for a number of weeks and i've actually worn it pretty much non-stop don't tell panerai uh I'm, I'm quite enjoying the cyclops it makes the date so easy to read uh and it doesn't look ugly on so i'm eating my words here just like one day i will probably say that the milgas or milgas however you say that word is actually a nice watch. <laughs> it's not the watch for me currently, but who never say never. Anyway, so the Rolex Submariner does have a very um, significant history and I'm going to touch on it briefly because as I said, someone would have done a whole video on this. Probably my my um, my YouTube buddy, uh, the Urban Gentry, TGV, he's probably done a much better video <laughs> than I have talking about the history of the, the Submariner. But for my own benefit, it's uh it was introduced in i think 1953 and it was designed for underwater exploration which makes sense given the name i guess and i think at the time it was about 100 meters water resistant it's now 300. now that i've said that basically good old hans Wilsdorf, um, the founder of rolex as you as everyone here would probably know uh, he wanted a watch that was designed for deep water exploration. So they came up with the idea and then the design and then the watch, the Rolex Submariner. I need, of course, to maintain accurate timekeeping, uh, something that Rolex has managed to do um, significantly well uh, since the dawn of their time and inception, it feels. Um, they seem to have really nailed that. Earlier models of this watch boasted simple elegant design with black dial so it really hasn't changed a lot since the 50s of course it's had different iterations and we'll talk about that very briefly uh, and some people argue that this latest model that i'm actually wearing is a is a nod's not the right word but kind of a um a design lean back to the original type model shape at least shape feel size um there's a bit of debate between the model i've got and the, mo the model that date predated that and that people actually didn't like that model so all the early models of this watch basically boasted very simple very elegant but very functional um style and and and, and capabilities uh, and it hasn't really changed significantly in that time You've had slightly different iterations with gold, ceramic, um, different colors, all those kinds of things, right? But at its heart, the design of this watch, the look and the feel of this watch really hasn't changed that much. Um, the, the most, I think one of the most famous, if not iconic models is probably the 5512 which ironically was Steve McQueen's watch. Now it's ironic that the 5512 was Steve McQueen's watch 
because to me, Steve McQueen was synonymous with the Daytona, but also, of course, the Tag Heuer uh, Monaco for his film um, Le Mans. And, um, but yeah, it's actually my favorite Rolex that he's also famous for wearing. Um, the 5512 just, it's probably perfection. It's the gold indices kind of make it pop. Um, they don't make that watch anymore. It just, yeah, it kind of makes me sad that I can't have that watch. But anyway, uh, in terms of like overall change style aesthetic, the Submariner, this one I'm wearing, is not that dissimilar to the watch, the 5512. For, other than the obvious things like the date and the color of the time, but you know, the, the look, the feel, the general size of the watch, they haven't changed that much. I think this is part of why this watch is so iconic, right? Because it just, it has really transcended time. It's, it's a timeless watch uh, in terms of its, its, um, its fashion aesthetic and how it's just sort of gone through. And I'm so excited that I got to have this watch in my collection. I got it the way I did. And that I also got this one out of the three that I could have had because to me this is just a classic elegant timeless watch that will never ever go out of style or out of fashion so with that in mind let's have a little chat about it so the particular model I have on is the 26610LN it was released in 2020 this particular model I'm wearing was purchased last year in December. Uh, now, interestingly, it's it's actually listed as a 41 millimeter case, but I measured this with my calipers and it's 40.6. Um, I don't know if that's a common occurrence because to be honest with you, I haven't I haven't measured, measured the case dials on my watches to see whether they actually marry up to what the stated specs from the manufacturer are. I know, um, I know Brit Pierce actually did a video on the Daytona a while back about that, so I can't remember what the, the outcome of that. But anyway, the only reason I got the calipers out is because I'd read different, <laughs> some, some reviews for this watch had it at 40, some had it at 41, someone actually had it at 40.6, so I was like, what the hell is the actual size of this watch? It's 40.6 millimeters. It's marketed as 41. They probably just round up to the nearest the nearest one, um, it's 12 millimeter thick. It's on an oyster bracelet, which I resized myself. Um, <laughs> it's um, Cerachrome bezel and it's got the 3235 caliber movement. It's water resistant for 300 meters. It's a 70 hour power reserve and it's now I will read this because I had to look this up, but it's not because they've lowered the rate of the ETA, but the mainspring and the gear train and the escapement and the new chronology escape wheel has allowed, has basically hollowed out the legs and it's made it a lighter movement, like it's reduced the mass, which means it actually, that's where the 10, extra 10 hours comes from, which I thought was quite, um, it's, I mean, the ingenuity in that is outstanding. It's plus or minus two seconds a day in terms of timing accuracy. Now again, I don't measure this in any way, shape or form on any of my watches. You guys know me, I own Hanarize. They're not about the most accurate timekeeping. It's about style over function with that watch. They're still pretty bloody good though. Um, but you know, they're not a fucking iPhone. If you want perfect time, get a computer. But that's not why we wear these watches, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, the accuracy of the Rolex is unbelievable. Part of the reason is because it's got a paracom blue or para, para, paracom bleu um, movement. The reason we have a 70 hour power reserve on this watch has to do with the fact that they innovated and came up with a new hairspring movement. Um, or I should say a new way of building a particular type of movement from the technical Jess point of view because you know I could waffle on for hours just reading stuff that you know is probably going to bore you more than it bores me. Cyclops in my view works um, and that is me changing my position on previously thinking and probably saying out loud if not to you guys to many people that I know that I thought it was ugly. 
I'm eating my words on that because you're right in the store it looks weird it just does I don't care what anyone says when you wear it and you live with it and you use it to read the date it's amazing <laughs> um, like it blows my mind how good it is this watch is so simple on the outside I'm not professing to say that it's simple in terms of its movement on the inside but in terms of its I mean I still can't believe that I've got a Rolex like it's it's unbelievable um, but everything about it like I, I still can't believe how fantastic that sounds like it's so different to anything else I have I will do a comparison video I think between this and my Seamaster 300M because I love that watch I still think it's a fabulous watch but I wonder where I'm going to come out in terms of the Rolex V Omega on this particular brand. I don't want to talk about the brands in general, but just on these two models, right? Because they're basically designed to do the same thing. But I can see how the Rolex Submariner ends up in someone's collection as a timeless piece to be handed down from generation to generation. I won't have any generations to hand down to, unfortunately. So hopefully my nieces and nephews will be really nice to me. But um, <laughs> I can totally see how that happens with a watch like this because it doesn't age. It's robust. Like you can, this is meant to be a daily beater, ironically. It's $25,000 on the grey market or thereabouts, Australian. It's 14500 Australian brand new if you can actually get one. But it's meant to be it's designed to be a tool watch, a daily beater, and it's exactly what it is, but it's got a little bit of style and panache to go with it. It's, it kind of is perfection. Now, I would have been happy with any iteration of this watch. So the bluesy was another model. So that's a two-tone. So like yellow gold, steel, blue, looks great. Pretty ostentatious probably even for me but hey I would have worn it and the other one I think was the Starbucks so you've got the green in there which I quite like to be honest with you I, and like I said I could have lived with any of them but am I happy that I got the black absolutely absolutely um, to start my Rolex collection I should note with a watch that someone in a store once told me it was for the end of my collection well um, you yeah, know it's pretty spectacular Everything about this watch is perfect. So you've got Rolex engraved on the inside dial of the watch with your serial number at the bottom where the six is, or the indice I should say for six. Um, the, the level of detail, the way the seconds hand just sweeps around is actually quite mesmerizing and it's probably the neatest I've seen other than in the controversial spring drive of a Grand Seiko. The loom on this watch is fantastic. It's quite blue, which you don't, I don't see, you don't ever see that a lot. Um, and so here we go. I'll take some video footage of this, but yeah. See the blue tinge in that? And just how bright it is. Uh, like it's still looming now. It's probably the best loom on a watch I've actually seen or, or have. Um, even the Luminox. The Luminox is cool because it's just, it's just always um, illuminated uh, in the dark. So like I said, good for a night, it's night clock. But here we go, it's still going. So it's the longest loom I've seen on any of the watches that I have in my dive collection. And you know, you should expect that from a watch that's called the Submariner. This watch has been iterated <laughs> for a particular purpose. Does anyone actually dive with this watch anymore? I don't. I honestly don't know. I mean, I've spoken to people who I know who dive, whether it's free, di free diving or scuba diving. And generally speaking, they do not wear a watch. And if they wear a watch, it's a digital watch that's purposely um, built and made for diving, like basically a computer on their arm. Um, it's not a tool watch like this. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, I love it. The fact that you could dive with this if you, um, were that way inclined, understood how to use it for that purpose. Um, you know, that's what I love about these watches, that they have these little extra functions, or I know they call them complications, but 
Sometimes I feel calling it a complication doesn't quite sound right because it's supposed to make things easier, not more complicated. It's kind of like, but anyway. Um, it's like the GMT. I think the GMT is kind of cool that you can set dual time zones and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I love this watch. I really do love this watch. I think it's perfect. I mean, the, cr the crown, the crown guard, everything about it is just perfect. It's proportioned well coming from someone who wears a very large watch generally. This at 40.6 millimeters is perfection on my, I think it's 17, 17 and a half centimeter wrist. Uh, it doesn't feel heavy, it feels light. You've got an easy, easy adjust on the bracelet which I think is fantastic because it saved me having to remove any additional links when I was sizing it up for myself. Um, it just, I mean, they've kind of really perfected the perfect tool watch. Now I kind of get it. Like I, I get the, this whole craziness with Rolex. I mean, I don't get the paying exorbitant amounts of money for them, but I get people's vervent passionate love for these watches that they I mean I don't understand why people have arguments with each other over them but I get the passion behind them I totally do it's a beautiful watch um, it makes you feel good when you wear it and you turn it over and you see the Rolex there it's just those kind of things you can't I don't know I can't describe it but I get it I totally get it not that I didn't like Rolex before of course I did but not having owned one or being able to live live with one on like this you know you just you can't quite get it until you get it so um you know that's my jess version of a rolex submariner review not really heavy on the detail just a lot of admiration really um and talking off the cuff do all those things that youtube love you doing like subscribe um and my podcast uh, with Jamie Allardyce is coming out very, very soon. We've spoken to people from Oris. We've spoken to um, people from Fears Watches. We've spoken to TGV, Talking Time Pieces with Tony. We're going to have all of these up hopefully from next month um, where we just get to chat watches. I know you guys love it like I do. Until next time, have a great week.